Hi, everybody. My name is Diego Mayer Cantu. I'm an innovation fellow here at the Smithsonian Institution, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Saul Griffith here today. Since the increase and diffusion of knowledge is the Smithsonian's core mission, uh, the reason I'm most excited to introduce Dr. Griffith today is because of his passion not just to invent new technologies, but to make science and technology understandable and accessible for everybody. He's a contributor and technical advisor to Make and Craft magazines and to Popular Mechanics, and he also co-authored a children's book uh, called How Tunes about building your own science and engineering gadgets. He also co-founded Instructables, a website with a very similar purpose. I'm not gonna list all of his various accolades. Uh, instead, I'll just let him show what he's up to. So without further ado, Dr. Saul Griffith. I actually love short introductions, and that was fantastic. Um, so I'm Saul Griffith. I work at a, a place called Other Lab, which you'll hopefully shortly understand. Um, and I guess the broad theme today is 3D, and I want to talk about a specific opportunity. I'm going to take a long way to get to that story. Um, the specific opportunity, I think, is enormously important and transformative. Um, so I show this slide because it expa explains the bags under my eyes, the slur in my voice. This is my nine-week-old daughter, Bronte, and this is why my talk will look more like a random tour of my desktop than a well-prepared linear narrative. Uh, this is her big brother, Huxley. Um, this is him giving me a lesson in architecture as we design our new house. Um, and this is to say, you know, this is the old way of interacting with three-dimensional data through two dimensions. Um, and then this slide, I think, is more important. Um, and I bring this up to say this is the opportunity. The opportunity before you is bigger than you can imagine. So Google built Google Maps, and, and that has three-dimensional three topography in it. But they didn't recognize that that data would one day be used to cut a cardboard uh, top, uh, topological map of our plot of land. Lego built these sort of digital assembling bricks or Duplos years ago. I'm not sure that they knew that they would conveniently be roughly one inches eight foot in scale and allow you to build two scale models of the house that you want to build or not want to build in this case. Um, the model is oriented to true north and we're actually doing real time shade studies in the yard. So we sat there for four or five hours looking at how the, the building and the shadows would interact with the, the land. Um, all right, so 3D for education for children, for makers, and for everyone uh, will be the discussion and the, the unexpected ways that you might be able to do that. Um, but perhaps because it, will, you know, it might help you to understand where I work and what I do day by day, I'll show you this lovely video that was actually produced by Autodesk, who we've been lucky enough to work with. Um, so Other Lab is an independent research lab, uh, and we work in a number of areas. Um, we are spectacularly lucky to actually to work in a nationally registered historic building, um, the Schoenstein Pipe Organ Factory in San Francisco. You can actually see we kept the pipe organs in the back. We now use an Arduino to play bad Christmas songs on them. Uh, one of the projects we're working on that I'm super passionate about is uh, soft robotics. So you can see a couple of the examples here. So these are some of the world's first ever machines that are made entirely out of soft, supple, compliant materials. So there's not a single hinge or rigid element in these except for the, the valves. So you can actually see it blow out there. So this is basically a walking bouncy castle, uh, if you will. Um, so obviously it looks like our office is a lot of fun. It certainly is a lot of fun. Um, you know, we do math, we drink coffee. Uh, we write all of our own design tools. I might skip some of this. Um, also, because I haven't prepared hugely well, we build cardboard robots. Uh, and we do a lot of computation, which will tie into the themes. Um, but this gives you an, a good idea of the, the space that I inhabit and the types of things that we work on every day. Maybe to talk about some of the specific projects, um, we work on a solar energy project where the Technology is actually based, um, the, the observation was you need many, many more, much smaller mirrors uh, to deal with the, 
the wind loads in a traditional solar farm. And so you want your mirrors to be more like scales and you need a, a new class of actuator that is much cheaper than traditional electric servo motors to drive them. So the, the actuators that are turning these mirrors with extremely high precision, so about 0.1 degree pointing accuracy, are really based on the actuators that you would find in the wings of many insects. So they're little pressurized vessels um, that you can sort of play some special engineering tricks to make them very high accuracy uh, things. And we're actually going to be deploying this technology for very large scale, low cost solar energy. Um, we obviously you saw the, the pneumatic robots that we're very passionate about. Um, one of the other applications for that is uh, for orthotics. So many of you have seen Iron Man. He wears his exoskeleton. He is so last year. Um, that is a very heavy, very rigid, very metallic thing. We're interested in the, the natural compliance of our systems that interface to our sort of fleshy compliant bodies uh, to actually um, you know, assist you. So this, this is actually just an elbow. It can give you about twice the strength you would normally have uh, or about four times the endurance. Um, just because it's funny, uh, I think the, this piece of the video, <laughs> once you start making everything soft, we made an inflatable helmet as our safety helmet. <laughs> Um, but for an aging population, so th this will be very important for home care, or, you know, self home care, um, and a whole lot of technologies. Uh, the soft robotics enables what's called co-robotics. So a traditional heavy, stiff, rigid robot is sort of a dangerous thing to work alongside. If it turns around and can't see you, it, you know, all of its 800 pounds knocks you off your feet. As opposed to these softer, cuddlier robots um, that have a whole lot of unique characteristics and are much more human-like. The interesting thing about both of these is um, obviously there's a lot of uh, inspiration from biology, but there are no design tools that exist for designing these things, and we had to look to all of our design memes, uh, to biological systems, um, to figure that out. So we also produce uh, CNC machines. This is another mill, so you've all heard of the, the 3D printer, which is getting a lot of press. Um, this is a, another machine in the same category of democratizing tools that will machine circuit boards and do subtractive manufacturing on the desktop to take 3D data and produce real physical objects. So this is the sort of future for the soft robots enable entirely new applications, um, unique sub submarine robots in this case, uh, orthotics like this or super suits. Um, and then of course, as mentioned in the introduction, I've had a, a, one of my long-standing passions and a project I'm lucky enough to work on with a wonderful uh, team, uh, married team, Nick and Ingrid Dragotta, um, is doing science education through comic books for children. So one last interesting project I work on uh, is, or is now being worked on with Google is called Makani Power. This is, uh, this is kind of a spectacular thing. So we which, you know, probably inspired because I grew up in the space race and uh, on, you know, my mother gave me models of the Wright Flyer as a, as a six-year-old and I was f building and flying my own kites as an eight-year-old. We developed uh, a wind technology, a wind power technology, where you actually fly a kite, although it doesn't look much like a kite, it's that very technological looking thing you see there. And this will fly into the sky where there is more wind and cleaner wind and actually flies in circles, all autonomously. So you've heard of UAVs. This is probably one of the most advanced UAVs in the world right now. It will autonomously launch off its nest, um, fly up to an altitude of you know, around 1,000 feet. It'll fly in circles at 200 miles an hour, about the same as the tip of a big wind turbine, and will produce very useful uh, wind-powered electricity. In terms of power generated, it uses one one hundredth roughly of the materials in the mass of a traditional system. So it's about uh, 300 tons for a traditional large scale turbine. An equivalent one of these might weigh five tons. So you get this very large mass reduction and cost reduction. I actually have 24 hours of the video um, doing this just to prove that we can do it. I might just leave you with that. Um, I, I think it's fascinating enough to watch for 24 hours, um, but many don't. So. This is to sort of show you, you know, my day-to-day -day is, is working very much um, out on the edge of sort of, sort of the, the extreme making and engineering and, and uh, applied science fields, um, trying to usher these new technologies into the world. So right there, 
the plane exits its power generating spiral and then uh, flies itself back down and lands in its nest. So one of, uh, one of, because of the things we do, traditional design tools, much like because of the things that you want to do in 3D uh, scanning, traditional tools aren't up to the task because everything you want to do is unique. So we also write a lot of our own tools and I give you this playful example. Um, sometimes we just do the tools for fun. Uh, we actually thought you should be able to take any three-dimensional model and convert it into a jigsaw puzzle. So this is actually uh, it's a Japanese anime character called a Pikachu. Um, and we take that 3D model and we show you how to, it automatically computes all of the jigsaw puzzle parts um, and produces that. So again, to, to help you anticipate the unexpected ways that the spectacular data sets that you produce might be used is you know, we could have a 3D jigsaw puzzle of every artifact in your collection in the gift shop, um, which would be you know, hugely, hugely interesting and interactive ways for, for kids, playful ways for kids to interact um, with, with artifacts of science, engineering, art, et cetera. Um, we're also doing Again, much, uh, uh, this is a brand new project we're launching uh, called Cube Team. It's a browser-based CAD program um, that's voxel-based. Uh, it, it uses a lot of the insights that Minecraft did. Minecraft probably has the largest user base of any CAD tool in the world, but it's not a CAD tool. It's a game where kids and, and adults get together and design three-dimensional worlds. And we've made it more, a little more design-focused. Um, and then this is actually a dinosaur model taken from a free uh, 3D data um, library, which is Google's 3D warehouse. So that you, you now get a, it may look like I work on far too many things. My wife insists that's true. Um, but you now have a sense of those things. Um, and I, I'm gonna, I now really want to return to the, you, you, you sort of see my qualifications in the, in the, in the passionate story I now want to tell you. And I would like to talk to you about the history of you know, makers. I guess that's what a lot of people, there's this thing called the maker movement. Well, what is it? And I want to argue to you that it's a continuation of something that's been happening for a long time. We were once all makers. You know, we were the butchers, the bakers, and the candlestick makers, and we all had to make things by necessity. And this is, this is sort of pre-industrial revolution. And pre-industrial revolution education looked like this. And I still think this is, this is an opportunity. Um, you know, education used to look very much like mentorship and apprenticeship. One-on-one -on -one was very skills-based, but you know, you, you, you learnt in a tactile sense an awful lot of applied science and engineering by doing these skills-based activities. And then the Industrial Revolution happened, um, and a, very, a lot of parents then went into factories. Sadly, a lot of children also went into the factories. Uh, the kids that didn't go into the factories had parents that were there, and we invented this new model of education, which was the one teacher to many students model. And the thing that we lost about 150 years ago is that three-dimensional education of mentorship and apprenticeship became sort of a sadly two-dimensional education. You know, we, largely the content came through two-dimensional uh, medium like books, boards, and desks. So. Um, I'll come back to that point and, and, and really drive it home, but to sort of give you, there was an interesting reaction against this industrial revolution, which was the crass revival led by William Morris. And I might argue this is the origins of the contemporary maker movement, um, that as people didn't need to make things by necessity, they started to want to make things for hobbies and for desire. And so, uh, th this was the origins of the craft revival. So Mar William Morris obviously made these beautiful textiles. Uh, one of his contemporaries, Harry Peach, concerned with the loss of skills and the capacity to do the types of things that William Morris did, wrote a wonderful series called The Dryad Leaflets, which were very specifically trying to teach people these traditional crafts and make sure that we didn't lose those, that knowledge. One of his contemporaries, of course, was Baden Powell, who you know, charged, you know, also observing that a lot of people were losing skills, yet the, the, the British Empire still needed them, invented the Scouts movement in some sense to be this spectacular mentor-based after-school program to do skills-based three-dimensional uh, education. Uh, right around this time, there was a profusion of these types of books. Um, 
which I, I happen to have a hobby collecting how-to books, uh, and, and this is one of my favorites. Unfortunately, they were traditional, you know, now I have a daughter, I'm hyper aware of these things. They were traditionally very, uh, very sexist, like the boy mechanic. Um, but so and I think we now need to address that. But these books, nevertheless, were, um, you know, fascinating, quite wonderful, and they would teach, they would teach tools and how to use tools uh, they would teach techniques such as uh, surveying, apropos to this uh, conference, and they would teach you how to build new technologies. And um, there's one of my favorite projects in this book. You'll have to now sort of close your eyes and visualize for a second, but it shows three young boys standing at the, at the top of a cliff. They've, um, they actually give you the plans to build w one of the right gliders in this book. So not the flyer, but the gliders that they flew as kites leading up to it. And it was encouraging the boys to jump off the cliff over the steam. There was, a, there was a locomotive coming along the trail tracks just below the cliff. And they had two flight paths. The successful one landed in a field over the train, over the town, into a nice grassy knoll. And then the dotted line showed a bad trajectory where it crashed into a barn. And um, I think that is perfect. And that maybe brings up another point is, uh, there's something a little bit dangerous about encouraging young children to, to build these things, and that's exactly why your 11-year-old wants to do it. And um, I think I, I would like to not allow the culture of liability that we have to prevent us from encouraging kids to engage with these wonderfully interesting, engaging activities that are enormously educational. I mean, if you can successfully build a glider and fly it over, the, over to the grass, um, You've learned just about everything you need to know to be an engineer um, and not prevent them be, be for fear of safety on the way there. This is a particularly, unfortunately, I can't remember which of the books it is, but I think it's enormously sub uh, suggestive of the opportunity that I referred to at the beginning of the talk. And um, you'll have to use your imagination a little bit again here, but this is, you know, again, turn of the century, somebody was saying, you'll see that the axis on the top there is age. So starting from five years and then going to over 18 years of age and going down is a list of different types of materials and different types of crafts and it, it sort of showed you how you would build a comprehensive set of skills um, over, the, over time if you roughly followed this. So it was sort of a curriculum of skills, if you like. And I think the opportunity or the thing I'd love to see now is let's Let's do this again. We now have the common core, which I think is a generally good thing. Um, but I'd like to see this, this age group across the top. I'd like to see the millions of artif you know, the common core down the left axis. And if you can imagine a third axis, I'd like all of the artifacts of all of your wonderful museums to be associated with an age and a skill and a craft and can be the entry point, the Trojan horse, to teach all of those wonderful you know, the, not only the skills, but also the theory and the science and the arts behind all of these things. And I think we have the opportunity to build that database, and I hope the opportunity won't be lost. Um, which reminds me, the real reason I showed you the picture of my daughter and my son in the introduction was to set the deadline for this. We have 10 years. I don't want them to miss out. Uh, so I think there is a little bit of an urgency. Um, I think. Certainly the public debate over education implies an, an urgency about how to improve education. And I certainly don't think it's the te I, you know, I'm, I'm a te this teacher sympathizer. I think they do a wonderfully difficult job under increasingly stressful circumstances. Um, and I think the opportunity for all of us is to give those wonderful hardworking teachers an unbelievable array of entry points for their students to fall in love with the things that they do. Um, Post-war, there was a lot more makers, and we, you know, before there was Make Magazine, there was Popular Mechanics, and magazines love it, like it, and we encouraged kids with these fantastic, and, and, their, and their parents with these wonderful visions of the future. Um, you know, it's shocking to think that today we're working on robots that look like this image that's 50 or 50 plus years old. Um, you know, they were in multiple languages. Uh, so there is this continuous line, and you know, the, the, the readership of popular mechanics today is still something like 8 million people. Um, so I think the maker movement is less a movement than a, a headline to capture an, a, you know, an enormous number of people who are already doing this, but they now have, they now have a banner to provide cover and, 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 and be justified under. 
uh, and so we should absolutely support that and increase it. So all of that brings us to now, you know, we have the hacker spaces and the maker spaces and the fab labs and the meetups and the startups and the mashups and the fairs and the festivals and the TV shows. So right in the, in the public mindset right now is all of this activity. And really the, what, probably the most important thing is we have, by virtue of being given the internet, this fantastic platform for massive collaboration for all of these people to mash up all of their ideas together and create beautiful things. Uh, so this is, you know, make affairs, you know, you see, you know, not, not tens, not hundreds, not even thousands, but tens of thousands of, of young children having activity, you know, having experiences like these at make affairs. Uh, the, only, the only sad part of this is they're doing it once a year, right? And I think we, we need to do it much more often. Now, the good thing is it's going international. This is an ad for the European make affair. So, one of the, the, you know, what is one of the underlying things? So why is this happening now in a new and invigorated way? I think the, the collaborative nature of the internet is, is a huge part of it, but then the other observation is driven by the consumer electronics becoming uh, low cost. Precision and control have become enormously cheap. So that is why you can now buy, you know, what would have been considered a supercomputer 10 years ago for $25, and you're even allowed to void the warranty and program it yourself. So that's the Arduino and the promise of it and it has an enormous number of people building all sorts of fabulously interesting things on it. It's why we have, uh, you know, curiously, so the patterns for most of the 3D printers that we think are spectacular, the reason 3D printing is, is a hot topic right now is not because it's new. All of the patents expired between two and five years ago. So it has become democratized and the monopolies are going away and we have fabulous upstarts. So these are just two friends of mine, Brie Predis and the MakerBot and Max Lebowski and the Formlabs 3D printer, and they're two of many uh, companies building, you know, I wouldn't call them cheap yet, but $2,000 is cheap compared to, you know, 10 years ago when you were buying one, it was $200,000. So they're spectacular. And I think the 3D printing, I, I sometimes I'm mischievous and I say 3D printing is a technology if you want to make landfill expensive and slowly. Um, and I don't really believe that. But I try to say that to emphasize a point that it's the 3D printing isn't the cool thing. It is this low cost precision and this low cost control, which is enabling a profusion of machines. The 3D printing is one small corner of what is this category called CNC or computer controlled machines. Others are laser cutters. Others are things like our mill, cardboard cutters, et cetera. The tools, uh, you know, robots, the cost, costs are coming down, water jets. Uh, five, you know, uh, routing machines. There's a huge number of these machines, and there's going to be a desktop version of nearly all of them within five years. And so, these maker spaces won't just be 3D printers; it'll be a, a whole lot of things. The tools are are, are really, you know, if not quite yet, very shortly, very democratized, including the software tools. Autodesk is doing a spectacular job and, and really been quite a visionary in the space with their one, two, three D. Uh, suite, including the, the 3D scanning apps that they're doing. Um, and, you know, to emphasize, some, this is some of the things that you can do with some of the software that, uh, that we work with Autodesk on. You can take a 3D model, you have no knowledge of 3D modeling, take a model that you like from the web. This is a four foot high, four foot high aluminum elephant uh, that was made for about $100. Uh, you can sit on it. Um, it's out of stainless steel. It's all, all automated software that gives you the blueprint and you can put it together in a few hours. So this digital fabrication doesn't just have to be small objects. They can be real human sized. Um, this is a zoo, again, of free 3D models. Um, this is to tell you, haha, you, that you won't expect what will happen to your 3D data once it gets out in the wild. Um, and sharing has become free. Instructables, Shapeways, TurboSquid, Circuits.io, all of these and many, many more um, places to get this engaging 3D content. I hope that the, you know, the Smithsonian and the other museums represented here dwarf the collections of 3D models that are at these places already. So um, let's bring it back to this beautiful, august institution that you know, is partly responsible for getting me interested in science. Um, there's in education circles, because I, I do work in education, I think about it a lot, there's an expression called museum as classroom, and I think, you know, 
our fabulo fabulous opportunity here is the museum in every classroom. Um, and you, know, you have, honestly, some of the most imagination-grabbing objects ever. That's why who you are. And um, you're no longer, you should see yourselves as an archive, but you know, your museum is going to be the curriculum. At least that's, that's my hope, and I think that's the possibility. And here we are, you know, using some Autodesk software again to, oh, to first produce those dinosaurs, small-scale models, and then for $120, you can save yourself a parking spot in San Francisco. <laughs> um, and this is just laser, laser cut, you know, $20, $22 sheet of plywood from Home Depot and a laser cutter, and you can have your own T-Rex. Um, and that's to emphasize, you know, it's, the, it can, it, it's gonna be a whole lot of beautiful and unexpected things. And you might think, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm really interested in science and I wanna teach science. Is this really science? And I think um, engagement, you know, the seven-year-old you engage today is the scientist that, you know, cures your cancer in 20 years, right? And I think, you know, I was watching everyone up here and I, I you know, I, I said yes to this talk even though I have a nine-week-old baby in part because I love you all. You all have jobs that I want. You all work with, you know, the, yeah. <laughs> And you know, and you get to work with the world's most valuable and most beautiful objects. And um, I think I, I, this, I don't want this to sound in any way critical, but because of that, you're all so earnest. Um, and that earnestness is great, uh, but earnestness will can repel a few kids. Let's let's be super playful. Think, remember what got you to doing the job that you're doing today. It was playfulness. It was the, the imagination. It was the beauty of the, the, the collections that you're, you're now uh, looking after or, or converting to 3D, I hope. Um, so that's to, you know, I don't need this slide now. You've got it much more passionately. You know, it's not just citizen science. I totally believe in citizen science. I think it's a wonderful thing. But it's citizen play. It's allowing the four-year-olds to play with the, you know, the 3D printed uh, models. Um, and those, and you're know, making, you know, help my daughter become, and you, you know, if you look at the statistics, it's terrible. Girls beat boys hands down in science through age 11 or 12, and then in math and science, and then we lose them all. We still don't know why, um, but you know, maybe the way we can, I want you to help my daughter have a chance of being a scientist if that's what she wants to do, or an engineer, by giving her engaging content that's not gender specific. Um, and I think that's, that's in and of itself is a wonderful goal. Um, you know, it used to be museum as field trip. I think we're all excited about the museum is everywhere. Uh, and I, I, I'm going to show you now, um, we curiously, uh, a couple of years ago, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, decided to run a program called Mentor to try and do hands-on education in high schools. Their observation was that the biggest threat to the US military was that they wouldn't have enough engineers and technicians to support the infrastructure of the US military within 25 years. So they needed an intervention that they weren't seeing come from, I'm not, not even sure if I meant to say this publicly, they didn't see coming from the Department of Education, NSF. Uh, so it was politically ill-fated thing from the start. Anyway, we were lucky enough to do a little bit of work under that, although the program is cancelled. I still think, however, the general vision is good. And, you know, I'm telling you that story now in some respects. If once we have this spectacular set of content, the teacher, you know, instead of having to prepare everything for the day, you know, what are you inspired to build today? And, you know, the, the teacher will be the curator of all of your materials and the handholder of the students. And I think the the, the, the teacher, the unbelievably inspiring teacher on the previous panel sort of showed more compelling examples than I can of this, but, you know, um, probably this is the most important slide, is, you know, your, the starting point for all of these people, all of these kids who, who can imagine something can be your 3D content. Um, and then they can go through, use Autodesk type software, and then computer-aided manufacturing, CNC and CAM, to build these things. Um, and you know, I'm a fan of, of cardboard. Basically, I'm a fan of anything that's fast and low cost because in the, in the, you, we should remember you've got an hour in a classroom. So machines that take 10 hours to build uh, something small 
that satisfies one kid. I think we really, we, we want to focus all of the technologists on making these experiences closer to real time for the kids if we really want to engage them. Um, this is Louise Leakey's uh, African skull data. Um, this is just to show you another playful examples um, of how you use these things. Uh, and this, I, you know, again, I'm only repeating and emphasizing a lot of what the, 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 the lovely set of earlier speakers today said, but it can be STEAM, right? So this kid wants to be an artist. How do I use 3D data to improve my art? Um, you know, he wants to do a drawing class, so he builds the skull, builds the whole skeleton, in fact, use it as a life model. Later in the day, use it as, you know, in the drama class. Um, and, you know, and you can make these artifacts that are actually one-to-one -one scale for, you know, this is old pizza boxes, so it's 25 cents or free, depending on how you look at it, type materials. 3D printing costs are coming down. I think it is going to be cost effective to do this. Now we can capture 3D from objects. Um, we, we've got an interesting problem. You know, you've got a few hundred today, um, but you've got a few hundred million more to do. There's your homework assignment. Remember, 10 years is the deadline. Um, and then with that, I, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure how much time I have left. Maybe I can ask. Five minutes, great. I, here's a, a long story. So I have a theory. If you want to see what the future is going to look like, you, you read the, unfortunately, it's not a public ar archive, but you read the archive of rejected thesis proposals. <laughs> so all of these bright-eyed PhD students have this great idea for this thing they want to build, and they've got a grumpy old professor who's got pressures on from their NSF grant to do a very specific piece of research so that they reject the proposals that are the students' imaginative future-forward project, and they make them do some you know, tomorrow research as opposed to next decade research. So in that vein, I wrote at least six failed thesis proposals. Uh, and I want to tell you about one of them. Um, so it makes me feel old to do the numbers. I was probably writing those thesis proposals 10 plus four, 14 years ago. Uh, and one of them was um, I was very interested in uh, morphogenesis. So how do you go from information in biology to the amazing three-dimensional st structural machines that are insects, or in my case, I was really, at the time, very interested in radiolara. And um, again, I, inspired by your collections, I w wanted to solve the problem of morphogenesis as an arrogant young PhD student. Uh, so the proposal was to take these things, these are colorized uh, ESEM images of a whole bunch of insects, and I just use them, a, one, because of their beauty, um, but two, to il illustrate the point. And uh, I wanted to build a 3D scanner, which was going to be a combination of SEM, microtomography, and, uh, and, and, and CT data to do full 3D reconstruction. Then I wanted to do clonal studies, so, you know, uh, have, a, have a cloned set of maggots, um, kill one every five seconds from, <laughs> from conception to, you know, to, to fruit fly. And, uh, and, um, and then do the 3D data so you could have not only 3D data for the, the, the adult, but the entire 3D video of development. Watch every, the, the placement of every single cell, the, the, you know, how, how, how did we move all of the proteins to build this unbelievable three-dimensional machine. Uh, anyway, it was rejected. Um, would have been cool. We can still do it. We should do it together. Uh, and that's to say, you think you have a data problem now. Um, I want, you know, 10 nanometer resolution chemical and protein data in my full 3D volumetric data, not just 3D surface data, of your entire collection as well. Um, try streaming that over today's internet. Um, but it is a good goal, right? And and we those types of things. And then you know, um, to think about um, how these things relate to my work today. You know, one of the reasons I wanted to do this was also uh, there's this field called MEMS, microelectric and mechanical systems. They do useful things like make the accelerometers in your phone and turn your brakes on in a car crash and explode airbags and all these things that are 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 hidden because they're so small but do miraculous things technologically. But the field of MEMS is really, if you look at what these MEMS are, they look like 
1860s steam age machines. They literally look like cogs and gears and beams on, on silicon. And then when you, you, and so, you know, we would spend days in these toxic environments, well, weeks and months designing these MEMS and then days in these toxic environments building these little machines and we'd be so proud of this little gearbox that we built and then you would look at the fly and you would be so unbelievably humbled and inspired to make new mechanisms and then so one of the reasons to get this full 3D data is these these machines have had a billion years to develop so many more elegant mechanisms than than gears and cogs and levers and you can see how that even influences the work that I do with a, a wonderful group of people at Other Lab today in our robots that break all rules of mechanical engineering. Um, so how do I tie all of that together? Um, I think uh, the, real, the real opportunity, and you know, maybe it's not tying it together, it's just saying it as emphatically and simply as I can. I think we have an opportunity to make a curriculum of toys that um, wildly improves the educational experience for everyone and enables us to overcome this 150 year sort of uninnovative gap in education where we went, went from 3D to 2D. We finally have the chance to go back. And again, I think you might you know, be a little concerned that I'm using the word toys, but I also really want to emphasize again, we need to make it, um, we need to make it super fun and super engaging uh, to kids. Their, their imaginations are wild, and um, I would love you know a million of your objects to once again be part of the toys that we have to teach every single physical principle, every design principle, um, to inspire people in the arts uh, and and literature, and and they can and they will, um, but let's not lose sight of you know focused on our technical problems. I think we need to think about the the curriculum problem and, and really inspiring kids with this stuff. Maybe uh, one tiny short story, I'm getting the white card um, before I go. When, when we wrote our How Toons book, I had the wonderful opportunity to do a book tour across the school. And when there were still um, independent bookshops, the independent bookshops would get you in and take you on a tour of local schools and you would go and do a talk in front of the schools. And I would do this, uh, these tours with Nick the illustrator of the comics, um, you know, by day, you know, actually at the moment, he's drawing one of the most co uh, popular comics. It's on the New York bestseller list. Um, and he draws Batman and Spider-Man and these types of the characters routinely for uh, DC and Marvel and the like. So he can draw anything instantly, anything a kid's imagination would ask. And, you know, I'm a, maybe a little atypically creative, but by the standards of my office where I feel like the uncreative dull one, um, there's plenty of engineers with enough creativity. So we would do this routine where we'd be in front of this group of 10 year olds and you would say to them, you know, first we would build a few projects with them and we'd show them a few skills and then we'd say, you know, for the next 20 minutes, you imagine if some, anything that you want to build and I will help you build it while Nick will draw the thing that we're designing and building together. Uh, the curious thing is if you, you know, well, the depressing thing was, too many of these 10-year-old kids um, had never been asked that question before. If you could build anything, what would you build? Uh, and I think it's one of the, um, it's a little bit sad. I think we need to, all the way through the educational age gap, encourage kids to be super creative and engaged in it by saying, what do you want to do? And, and, and letting them have some agency in what they do. If you want to create uh, connections to your kids, give them agency in their education. So uh, those who weren't frightened away by the question, would just ask you for a spectacular array of things. I will say, on average, 10-year-old boys want flying skateboards. <laughs> um, the curious thing, on average, 10-year-old girls, I don't really want to say this, but it was, it was true. Um, and some of us, you know, 10-year-old boys says, you know, how do I build a flying skateboard? And you say, well, Bernoulli's theorem says this, and then we do, you know, you need wings, and they probably need to be this big, and then it needs to, pro you know, if you're 30 kilograms, it'll need a little engine, da da da. Easy to build a flying skateboard. And then the girls would say, well, I want a machine that will read the dreams of my friends so I can play them back to myself. <laughs> uh, to which I would say, um, you're, you have a future in science, right? And, and not only did you, you imagine, you have a 50-year future <laughs> in science. That's even harder than 3D imaging insects. Um, so it's a beautiful question. And 
at first I would, uh, I would say, well, there are these people at Harvard, they slice the back off the skull of a cat and they stick electrodes in and they play cowboy videos. This is a true experiment. They do black and white Western videos in front and they try to see if you can see John Wayne at the visual cortex at the back of the brain to try and map it. And about you know, two of the 10-year-olds would be left standing. Um, so I, I learned to avoid that answer. Uh, but the, you know, just to indicate, again, the unexpected creativity of kids that we can inspire um, and, and encourage in every possible way. My, one of my favorite all-time answers was this. We were actually about an hour and a half s south of here, somewhere in, in the middle of Virginia. And a young girl said, um, I want to build a robotic cow. I said, sure, why? Well, and then she immediately went into her lecturing mode. Well, as you know, cows have four stomachs. Um, the first stomach will be the rinse cycle, no, no, the wash cycle. The second stomach will be the, the rinse cycle. The third cycle, the, the third stomach will be the dry cycle. And the fourth, the fourth stomach will fold and press your clothes before it poops your clothes out into your wardrobe. <laughs> um, and that's why I want to live in the future that those 10-year-olds can create for us. <laughs> Thank you.